Jazz scales. Which ones do you need to know and how do you practice them? Well, pour a cup of Joe. Let's have the talk. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace. And if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button to make your diminished scales a little bit less insecure. Now today we're talking about jazz scales and it's the first in a six part series dealing with the scales. And each of these lessons will have a built-in workshop for alto and tenor saxophone, some call and response exercises, and a free PDF download for each of the exercises covered in this video series. I'll put a link down below. Now, if you're wondering, should I really be spending that much time learning scales? Should I be learning chords? Should I learn how to play chords on the saxophone? Well, short answer, no, you can't play chords on the saxophone. You can outline chords using something we call arpeggios, but here's a secret for you. Anytime you play a scale, all the chord tones are contained within. They're inside the scales. So scales are an excellent way to not only build technique, and we're gonna learn a lot of exercises with articulation to start to address those aspects, but they're also a good way to learn key centers. Get within a key and really learn the insides and outs of what makes a key a key, but largely the key signature. But we're gonna get a better feeling for key areas, which when we're improvising, remember, we're building melodic ideas in key areas. Scales are critical for that because the building blocks of melody are scales with skips and leaps. Yes, that will contain chord tones and at times arpeggios, but scales are really the building blocks. You're gonna get a lot of mileage out of them. Also, don't forget, scales are free. You don't need to buy a $29.95 PDF to learn your scales. Though you can buy my three-part Scale Mastery Masterclass series for three easy installments of $99.95, I'll put, kidding, everything we're doing is completely free, including the Saxophone Fundamentals book, which you can find in the link below, that has all major and minor scales and intervals completely free contained within that book. So assuming I've convinced you that learning scales is important, let's talk about the how and what to practice scales. Now the first problem we need to overcome is how we practice scales. And the chances are, if you're like me, you learned your first major scale in band class more years ago than you care to admit, and it sounded something like da 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 Starting in the tonic, going up an octave and back down with that little rhythm that all band students seem to play. Now the problem with that is, say you learn your scales that way, then you're improvising, you see a D major chord, and you think, aha, D major, I got this. And you'll quickly discover that's not great preparation for jazz improvisation. So let's talk about how we want to practice our scales. Our workshop today is dealing largely with starting on different scale degrees and altering the motion. But a couple of ground rules when we practice scales before we get to the specific patterns and alterations. Number one, thou shall practice all your scales full range. Now, what do I mean by full range? Well, we start on the lowest note in the key. So today, and for these exercises, we're gonna be dealing with the key of D major. So the lowest note, lowest tonic, which means the first scale degree in the key is D, obviously, and we're gonna start on low D. Then we go to the highest note in the key. Now, for a lot of us, that's going to be F sharp. If you have a high F sharp key on your saxophone or you're comfortable using the front fingering, basically the initial altissimo fingering for F sharp, you can go that high. If you don't have an F sharp fingering or a key on your saxophone and you don't feel comfortable up there, you can absolutely start at E, or excuse me, stop at E, there's no problem. Then we go to the lowest note in the key signature. In this case, it is low B and return to the tonic. Now, we want to always slur our full range scales when we begin practice, and here's why. Whenever we add articulation, there's a brief gap or alteration to the sound, and it can hide inefficiencies in technique. So when you practice your full range scales, practice them full range, hopefully that goes without saying, and slurred. It should sound something like this. <laughs> Now, in addition to learning just the conjoined scale, the note to note scale in full range, I also recommend you learn scales in thirds where we skip a note and create little stacked thirds going up and down full range. And those are included in the Saxophone Fundamentals book in the link for free. <laughs> Now, 
Now, that's going to be an excellent way to build further technique and add some skips and leaps within the scale. And you'll find if you do that and the conjoined scale, you'll find that a lot of what jazz language is is going to be combining little skips of thirds and scale-wise motion. There's plenty of exceptions, of course, but this is going to get you a lot of mileage and certainly set you up technique-wise to play most phrases you can hear in your head. Now, all of today's exercises are based around major scales, but you also obviously need to learn your minor scales. And you may be thinking at this point, a question screaming in your head, Dr. Wally, how many scales do I have to learn? There's thousands of scale combinations, mode combinations, hybrid combinations, jazz school scales, and some specific person's teaching method where they created a newly named scale. There's endless possibilities. I like to keep things simple. We have a limited economy of time, energy, and sanity. So rather than learning 1,500 different types of scales, I like to think of simply 12. 12 major and 12 minor. And specifically, I practice the major scales, obviously, and the minor, I like to do the harmonic minor form of the scale. There's a lot of reasons, and I'm happy to justify that in a later video. But you may be thinking, well, what about the Dorian? What about the jazz minor? What about the yada, yada, yada? Well, if we simply think of 12 major and 12 minor, and then add alterations to those, we can get limitless combinations. So when I'm improvising in a major key, I'm thinking the major scale. I may start on a different note, which creates the Dorian mode, but I'm simply thinking in the major key, and I add alterations and colorations to create whatever I want, and I have access to all 12 notes. Same thing with the minor. The harmonic minor gets you a lot of mileage, and we can make small alterations to that to get nearly any sound, well, literally any sound by, mon by modifying that scale. And remember, just because you add notes to a scale doesn't mean you have to call it a new scale. You can glue wings under your family's cat. You haven't made a new animal. You've just made a pissed off cat. So I like to think 12 major, 12 minor, and make alterations as necessary. Now today's exercises are gonna focus on a couple of things. Number one, getting away from starting on the tonic. So these exercises will actually start on a different chord tone instead of going up we alter the motion and create some contrary motion. Next, we're gonna to start to add in some thirds, some intervals with the scale. This is still diatonic, it's just using the major scale. And when, later when we do the minor scales, it'll be diatonic within the key. But we're gonna mix up some thirds with the conjoined scale, and we get something that sounds more like this. And already you can hear there's big possibilities and a lot of fertile ground for building melodic content if we just use the scale and scale in thirds. Finally, we're gonna add some common alterations to these patterns so you can get a feel for what the more traditional bop style language may sound. Now you may look at that and say, but isn't that the hexatonic bebop minor? It's just a major scale. We're making some alterations to it. We don't need to give it a fancy name. Now these alterations are certainly not exhaustive, but to give you some ideas of how you might add some chromatic passing tones and some surround tones to your scale patterns. Now here's a suggestion of how to practice these. Before you do the play along exercises, which we have, practice them first by reading them on the sheet of music. Practice them first, slurred, making sure our technique is pristine. Then add in light articulation. <laughs> Now, once you're sure the articulations are in the right place, practice it again, adding a little bit more air inflection, not tongue, not harder tongue, but a little bit more air accent to the beginnings of the articulated notes. <laughs> Now remember, these exercises are simply a starting point, an idea of how you can apply this to other scales, start on different scale degrees, and most importantly probably, uh, an exercise for improvisation. Don't just play what's written on this page. Put on your metronome, two and four if you can, and start to improvise the scale, just going up and down and aiming for different chord tones while you do it and see how it sounds. The best way to get better at improvising is practicing improvising, and just doing it diatonically with a scale is a great set of limitations you can add to start to get more comfortable with improvising without being overwhelmed with chords and a million other things. 
isolation and repetition is the key to mastery. So practice these exercises. If you need to slow them down while doing the play alongs, you can use the gear icon, the settings on desktop or the three dots up at the top on mobile, slow them down, speed them up and have some fun. So if you have any questions, hit me up in the comments below. I'll see you next week dealing with more skill articulation patterns and building speed and technique. So in the meantime, take the wings off your cat and go practice.